I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to The Bigfoot Project. Warning, this video contains strong language and profanity. It may not be suitable for children and sensitive adults. I was born in Brevard County, Florida in 1950. I have lived here, except for four years military, my whole life. From east to west is the Atlantic Ocean, the intercoastal waterway, Brackish, then the St. John's River, one of three rivers in the world that flows north from beginning to end until the 80s because the river would grow in size from 200 feet to two miles wide. All that land was flood control. It could be fished, hunted for hogs, and frogs gigged all year. West of the St. John's was large ranches, farms, and very large tracts of untouched land owned by corporations who left it open use. It was an outdoorsman's dream. My dad, uncle, and their friends were country people that gave nature every opportunity to give up what it wanted us to have. It was an all-year-round event for them. They had milk cows, hogs, chickens, deer dogs, duck dogs, jeeps, airboats, outboards, and all the stuff needed to have fun. My dad started me young. At 12 years old, I was trusted enough to go hunting with my dad or my uncle with my bow or my 410. At 13, I was turkey hunting when, what I was told later, must have been a panther screamed directly behind the tree I was sitting against. I froze and I never felt so small. At about 14 or 15, I was with a friend in an 8-foot pram with a 2-horsepower outboard motor. We were trolling for speckled perch. Every time we trolled by this one spot, we caught fish. We tried casting, but got no hits. Troll by and catch fish. So we just kept going back and forth. On one pass, I saw a big gator moving from one side of the river towards the middle. This gator was a lot longer than our boat, so I told my friend to slow and let him go across before we got there. He slowed, and the gator submerged. We were reeling in the jigs. Then all of a sudden, the gator tried to come over the front of the boat and slid off. It tried again and again as we were backing up. Finally, on one of his tries, I picked up a three-foot paddle and hit him as hard as I could on the nose. When he hit the water, he spun a 180 degrees and knocked the front of the boat almost 90 degrees sideways. We both almost went out. As I was laying there half in and half out with my face at water level and water pouring in over the sides, I didn't feel as apex as I had a few minutes ago. Flash forward about 10 years. The same friend that was in the boat with the gator and I decided to take my jeep out by Holopaw, Florida to see if we could get to this hard-to-get-to canal to bass fish. We tried to get unstuck until almost dark, knowing we had a five to six mile walk to get back to the paved road. I knew if we angled east, we would hit the big flood control dike and have easy walking all the way. We had walked for about 45 minutes through the woods following cow trails toward the dike. Then we both heard a roar that, to me, sounded like a movie was starting. It sounded like a lion about three quarters of a mile away. Hard to tell. We walked about a mile, making good time up on the dike road. It roared again. This time it was half the distance and straight behind us, not out in the woods. I had never heard a lion-like roar in the woods. Whatever it was, was trailing us at twice our speed. My friend said, just keep walking. We walked another quarter mile, and that thing roared very loud again, about 50 yards back and on top of the dike. I immediately turned and shined my old flashlight behind us. No eyes. I shined both sides, slopes, no eyes. I turned to ask or say something to my friend, and he was gone. He yelled, come on, hurry up. I did exactly that. When I caught up, he was about halfway up a 10-foot-high chain fence enclosure surrounding a spillway. When I got there, I turned to see if there were eyes. Then I put the light in my pocket and started climbing up the outside. All of a sudden, in the dark, I hear a total commotion going on inside the enclosure, and my friend is climbing back out. Somehow, a 7-foot gator had gotten in there. I decided I'd rather be inside with the gator than hanging on the outside, when I climbed over, it was too much for the gator, and he bailed off into the spillway. We stayed there for about 20 minutes, listening and shining, and heard nothing. We climbed out the other side, walked the last mile, and never heard that lion-sounding roar again to this day. 
but there was that less than apex feeling. Flashback to 1963. My dad comes home from work and tells me to get his headlight out of the boat. I went back into the house and he had his shotgun and a box of shells on the table. This was not out of the ordinary for dad and my uncle. My uncle walks in and asks me if my dad had told me they were being deputies to be part of a posse. It seems there were some ape or gorilla running loose and scaring people out in Holopaw. About 30 men hunted that thing for two days and nights. Still nothing. They said it stunk so bad the dogs wouldn't trail it. Later, National Geographic did an actual investigation with hair samples and foot casts and determined it was what we call skunk ape today. Flash forward to 1980. My brother-in-law and I were squirrel hunting. We were about four miles west of the Lion Roar Dyke and about five miles from Holopaw. We both had 22 LR semi-autos. We were in an oak head when one squirrel decided to play hide-and-seek. I told my brother-in-law to walk around the other side of the tree so one of us would get a shot. He had to walk around about a six-foot-high, 30-foot diameter palmetto patch to get where he needed to be. All of a sudden, he lets loose about ten shots as fast as he could. I hear grunts, the tusks sharpening, chomping, and palmetto crashing coming at me. The biggest wild hog I had seen in all my years in the woods came out twenty feet away, and he was mad. I did the same as my brother-in-law to turn him away from me. My in-law said it walked out of the palmettos about five feet in front of him, looked at him, and chomped his teeth. This is why my brother-in-law opened up on him. Now we had to deal with it. It was so big it never ran. It trotted. Probably 300 to 350 pounds. It went into a field that was open of trees and had patches of three to four foot tall palmettos all over. My in-law took off to get in front of it. I saw him stop and shoot another eight to ten times and start back towards me. I was standing on a grass path wide enough for a jeep. I figured by watching my in-law that it would cross that path about 50 feet away. I was going for a kill shot behind the ear, so when he crossed the path, I only fired once. He stumbled, but kept going toward a little cypress head. I could see my in-law coming through the palmettos and ran to meet him. He reloaded again and started toward the cypress. I was putting more shells in my rifle when I focused past my magazine to see someone standing on the edge of the palmettos next to the path. It was about 50 yards away, just staring at me. There were still two hours of daylight left, so I could see its eyes, nose, the mouth was closed, very short neck, couldn't see ears, but maybe under thick hair. It had very wide shoulders, a thick chest, and long arms. It had very little, if any, hair on its palms or bottom of the feet. Its hair color was black with red tinges. I would guess about seven feet tall, based on the palmetto height he was standing in, and probably double my weight of 200 pounds. Hard to tell with all the hair. It stepped into the path. It looked at me, then just turned and walked away. I watched it walk a hundred yards more down that path. Where it came from, I haven't a clue. I was looking at the field the whole time watching my in-law. We killed the hog, but together couldn't drag it out of the cypress head. So we field dressed it right there and still struggled to drag it back up the path. We could not pick the hog up. We even tried cutting down a tree to carry the hog between us, but it broke in half. And we are both not weaklings. We left the hog there and hurried back to camp to get our two friends and a buggy. We were gone 45 minutes at the most. When we all got back to the spot, it was gone. We took our friends to the cypress head to show them that it couldn't have come back to life and run away. The drag marks were there, but the intestines weren't. We walked back to where we had left the hog and started looking around. I noticed the pieces of the tree that broke in half trying to carry the hog were gone. We found them down the path where it had walked out of the palmettos. They were put in a V with the point facing the direction it took when it walked away from me. I knew nothing of Bigfoot except I read they smelled bad, were hairy and big. I did know about making signage for travel. Who left the V and who was it left for? That's when I told them what I had seen. They laughed at first then went quiet. My brother-in-law never even smiled. He knew. He now felt less than an apex awareness. I learned at an early age and was reminded of it now and then in my life. 
I think the awareness lessens the effect of inserting myself into any environment, but also being cognizant that my arrival did not go unannounced. Tom writes, I'm 51 years old, and when I was 13, I was with my father and a friend of his. We were going for a horseback ride into an area near Lost Creek, Utah, that was on private property and rarely visited by people, called Chinatown, because of the sandstone rock formations that look like Bryce Canyon, Utah, National Parks, about 300 miles due south from there in the same mountain range. We were asked to shoot the porcupines in the area because they had become a menace, so we were carrying 30-30 Winchesters for the job and had been shooting several along the way. They were usually in trees when we would find them. As we began up a ridge line, I noticed down in the bottom of the valley about 150 meters away a cottonwood tree in which I thought I saw a porcupine. I said to the adults with me, there's a porcupine, but as I continued to watch it, I realized it was too big for a porcupine and then thought it was a bear, but soon discovered it was not a bear. As I watched it, it was about the same size as I am now. I'm six foot four and 250 pounds, and it was about 20 or more feet in the tree. Then it must have noticed us, because it jumped out of the tree and landed on its back feet, like a gymnast sticking a landing. It then walked on its hind feet from the bottom of the tree, about 40 feet away, to an oak brush hedge line, and then turned to face us, then squatted like a man may have squatted into the brush, and disappeared, so it was no longer visible, but it could watch us. It walked in what was an unnatural human gait, but was smooth for it. Its arms swung unusually more than a human gait. It was covered with dark brown hair that appeared even from that distance. I said to the adults with me that we should shoot it, but they said that they were afraid its mother was around, and we turned round and went back to the truck, packed up and left, without reaching the intended destination of Chinatown. The adults were clearly shaken and afraid, and maybe I should have been, and they would not talk about it after the incident. It was as big as a tree. This happened in 1990. I was 18 years old at the time. I live in Long Beach, California. It didn't happen in Long Beach. It happened on the way back from the Marine Base in 29 Palms. My friends and I were always up to no good. We all had our run-ins with the law, with the exception of my friend, Bob. The five of us decided we were going to join the Marine Corps to escape the city, but only my friend Bob was clear to join at the time. The rest of us had outstanding warrants, mostly for underage drinking and driving without a license. But we all vowed that if we couldn't join, we were at least going to drive him once a month to and from the base home, until he bought a car. It was about a three-hour drive one way without traffic. The first two trips went well, but on the third trip back after dropping off my friend Bob, my friend Keith, who was his brother, decided to race a Mustang down the highway, and wouldn't you know it, we got pulled over for doing about 100 miles per hour. It was 6.30 p.m., I know, because of the clock on the dashboard. The cop was cool. He didn't take any of us to jail for outstanding warrants, but he had to impound the car. Now, mind you, two-lane highway, sun going down, and this is before cell phones and Uber. We flagged down a taxi mechanic in Yucca Valley, he said it would cost us a hundred bucks for a ride to Palm Springs, which was about 15 to 20 miles away. <laughs> yeah, right. We decided to call my brother instead. At about 7.30 p.m., we found a payphone. He said, my brother, that it would take him four hours to get to us due to traffic. So we said, all right, we'll be walking down Highway 62 to the 10 freeway. We were young and pretty stupid, so here we are, four dummies walking down the highway with the sun already gone. Oh boy, the first three and a half hours were, I have to say, great. Watching the stars and the moon, just that every car that would pass by, the people would look at us strange, except for two of them. They offered us a ride, but we said that my brother was on his way, and we just decided to walk to meet him. About 15 to 30 minutes before we got picked up, I was looking at the moon setting over the hills and how stunning it looked, but I also said out loud, well, so much for our light. At about 300 yards away, opposite of the moon on top of a small hill, I saw someone standing next to a Joshua tree. The only thing is, this person was as big as the tree. Normally, the trees grow about 15 to 20 feet tall. I could be wrong, or it could have been a small tree. 
Then it turned its head toward my right. That's when I saw its snout, like a giant coyote standing up. I bumped my friend and said, Look toward the hill over there. What do you see? He said, Looks like someone is watching us. Then he said, What the f***? And I said, I know, huh? He said, There ain't no bears in the high desert, that's for sure. Then it crouched down and stood back up and starts walking down the hill towards us. We all see that part. Before I could say anything else, my friends were already running down the highway. I ran to the other side of the highway and caught up to them after about one minute of flat-out running. That's when I scared them enough to start running again. They didn't know I had crossed over to the other side of the highway. Anyways, we thought that was it for us. We started picking up rocks and kept walking, hoping my brother was not too far away. As we were walking in fear, I hear something about 30 feet away behind me in the brush, and I was at the tail end of the group. I yelled out, All right, you fucking son of a bitch. I ain't running no more. So I started throwing rocks in the direction I hear the noise. Then all my friends join in and started yelling too. After all of the rock throwing had stopped, we heard growls coming from different directions. About three different directions. We started hauling ass again. After stopping for a breath and then running again a couple more times, I saw one, standing up as high as nine to ten feet, walking along the brush about twenty feet away from us, never getting too close to be noticed. It seems that these creatures were stalking us and waiting to eventually strike. It had a head like a coyote, but walking like a man. I kept wondering, am I going crazy? I just kept walking, not alerting my friends. They were trying to figure out why a bear or bears would be all the way in the desert. I could only catch a glimpse of the creatures as the cars would pass by. About 15 to 30 minutes of this on Highway 62 between Yucca Valley and Marengo Valley seemed like forever. At last my brother shows up and we all are yelling at him to open the doors to his station wagon. As we left, we could hear what seemed to be coyotes howling, but really loud. This felt like that movie, The Texas Chainsaw, when that lady finally gets away, but without the blood or killing. Anyways, I'm 44 years old now and still can't forget that night. Still to this day, can't even tell anyone but my family, but hearing all those other people on your show that have encountered this thing gives me, if you can say, some sanity. Keep up the good work. There's a lot of us out there that are afraid to speak out, but I think it's about time. Our camp was destroyed. My first sighting was when I was driving home from my friend's house. I made this drive at all times of the day and night, and one fall night, while driving home, I was driving westbound on West Mountain Road in Canton, Connecticut. There's an S-curve in the road, and when I rounded the first bend, I spotted a big, dark, hairy creature. The creature was bipedal with long, dark hair, and was standing a little hunched over. I also noticed that its arms were longer and seemed to come down to about its knees. It took one bound and was out of sight around the other bend. I stepped on the gas to try and see it again. When I rounded the curve, it was nowhere to be seen. So I then pulled over and rolled my window down and turned off my car so I could try and hear it. Not having any luck, I got out of the car and walked into the woods to try and find it. I knelt down and got real quiet and tried to let my eyes adjust to the darkness. I wasn't afraid of what I saw. I honestly thought it might be someone joking around. I then heard a few crunches of twigs or branches breaking, along with an odor that smelled like a skunk. I also got an overwhelming feeling I was being stalked or watched closely, so I decided to leave. I didn't say anything to anyone about this because I felt they would think I was a nut. My second experience was a couple months later, in December either 1986 or 1987. I went camping with two of my friends and my dog. We drove into the Federal Forest as far as we could get on the fire roads and then packed in about two more miles. We set up camp in a small clearing next to a little spring-fed creek. We knew it was going to snow that night, so I set up an old military pup tent for our firewood. We had another tent for the three of us and my dog to sleep in. We put our food in a bag and hung it in a tree to keep animals out of it. It was now dark out, and I figured we didn't have enough firewood for the entire weekend. I could see a big tree a little ways away from the camp that was about three feet wide and eight feet tall. 
I told my friends that tree must have broke off, so we could probably find wood there where the rest of the tree was. We didn't take light, so our hands would be free. The firelight was enough. As we got closer, I remember telling them, it smells like a skunk may be near. I completely forgot of my other experience until our big tree trunk moved a few feet away. I was the first to see it, and I asked my friends, did you see that? And told them what I saw. They hadn't, but growing up in the woods hunting, hiking, and camping since I was young, I was concerned it might be a bear standing on its hind legs to get a better look. We stood there for over a minute, when all of a sudden, the tree ran away from us on two legs. We freaked out and ran back to the car and took off. I realized after we got home, my dog was still out there chained to a tree because he wouldn't stop barking in the direction of the mysterious running tree trunk. I went in my house and grabbed my 3030 Winchester and Colt 1911 45 ACP and went back to get my dog. When we got back, my dog came running at us out of the woods, obviously scared. He had broke the metal cable he was on and was shaking a lot. When we got back to our campsite, we found it a mess. Everything was thrown around, but nothing was missing. I looked at the food and it was still there, and there was no claw marks on the tree or rope. We decided, since we were armed, it would be safe to stay the night. After we got back in the tent, my friends fell asleep, but I couldn't. I just listened carefully to the sounds. I then heard footsteps approaching the tent, and my dog jumped up growling with his hair on end. The steps stopped outside my side of the tent, and then something pushed in on the top. I then pulled out my pistol and yelled, Get away or I'll shoot! I heard a grunt, then running away. To this day, I have no idea what it was, and only told my family of the experience, until now. Then it started swaying back and forth. Briefly, this is the encounter. I was nine years old, and during the spring of 1972, I had, as most of us had when we were young, tree houses, and I also had an underground fort next to the big tree which I had my tree house in. I was digging and clearing up my underground fort one Sunday afternoon and had worked on it for a couple of hours. In and out I was going through the hole which was the entrance down into the fort. Right next to the fort was a small thicket of trees about five feet from my entrance and about fifteen feet wide and ran down the length of the property, paralleling the apple grove. I had my head down in the entrance and I had suddenly felt I was being watched. I raised my head up out of the entrance and stood up, then turned around and ten feet from me, to my right, was an astounding sight. The Sasquatch was about seven to eight feet tall, and was staring directly at me. Stunned, I stood there, and just looked at it for ten minutes, not believing what I was seeing. It had white fur around its eyes, which went into a goatee, down into a white patch on its chest, with light brown hair and fur around its face and on its body. Looking back, I was astounded how beautiful this creature looked, wasn't messed up and with no smell. Looked like it came from a beauty salon because the top of the head looked like it was combed back. I know it sounds strange, but it's true. I was insane for what I did next. I started walking toward it to make sure it was real and got about seven feet from it. Then it started swaying back and forth. The fear of God struck me that this was real and I ran as fast as I could to the house. I ran upstairs to my dad's office yelling that I saw a monster in the backyard, and dad just poo-pooed it. Well, I wasn't going back outside, and went to my room and looked through the window at the location of where it was standing, and it was still there. I stayed in my room, really upset, and calmed myself down. I got the courage about a couple hours later to look back through the window at the location, and it was gone then. A couple of nights later, something around 9 p.m. was making noise outside my window. So I pushed the curtain back, and boom, he was staring right at me. I shut the curtain and crawled under my bed and stayed there till I fell asleep. My friend and I were fishing along the Rocky River in the Rocky River Reservation in Cuyahoga County, Ohio. We were up on a rock wall that was about eight feet above the water. We'd been fishing there for about two hours when we saw a herd of deer cross the river away from us. About five minutes later, we could see something moving around in the woods directly across from where we were sitting. 
We just figured it was a deer and continued to fish. Then I realized that if it was a deer, it would have to be really tall or standing on its hind legs. It looked as though it was trying to eat leaves off the trees. The sunlight caught its eyes, and I realized it was looking forward at us with these glowing reddish-orange eyes. Glowing from the sunlight, and I'm not implying it was possessed scary demon eyes or something. As I was trying to figure out what this deer was doing, I realized it was starting to make its way out of the woods. This is when my friend and I realized it was not a deer at all. A large black image that was standing on two legs started to appear through the trees. My friend took off with her fishing gear at this point and went to her car. I continued to stand there in disbelief of what I was seeing. It stood there at the base of the woods looking at me. I could see this creature standing plain as day 20 feet across the river from me. I could see it well over six feet tall and had black fur from head to toe. Once I realized what I was looking at, I grabbed my fishing gear and took off across the field to my friend's car. I even tripped and fell over at one point and peed my pants in fear that it may have been chasing me because I started running. Once I got in the car, I asked my friend what she saw and she said she wasn't sure but that she was never going to Rocky River Reservation again. My husband was telling a friend what I saw at the Rocky River Reservation. He was actually doing so because he was making fun of me. When he told this person about the incident, he looked at my husband almost confused and started to laugh. He said his girlfriend and him were making a path near that area, and he said his girlfriend pointed into the woods and said, Did you see that monkey? He says he never saw anything, but his girlfriend swears to this day that she saw an ape-like creature running on all fours through the woods. I was out looking for deer with my mother and sister. We would drive the back roads and check certain fields and roadways and keep count of the deer. At the time, the area was still mostly wilderness. My mother was driving this night, and I was riding in the back seat. It was a warm night. We were riding with the windows down. As we pulled up to an intersection, we had to stop at a stop sign. While we were stopped, I looked over to the right and noticed a big brown animal about 10 yards away. It looked to be about three and a half to four feet tall. I could not identify the animal. I knew it wasn't a bear. While I was looking, I was surprised when it stood up. I would estimate that it was over eight feet tall. I rolled my window up right away because the animal was just standing there looking at us. As we continued down the road, my mother asked what I thought the animal was. I said, what animal? At the time, I was unaware that they had also seen it. My mother said, the animal that caused me to roll up my window. A couple of years later, one evening my girlfriend and I went for a ride to look for deer. We would take rides three or four times a week, mostly riding the back roads. One evening, as we were driving down a road, I noticed something walking in the ditch on the right side of the road. At the time, I kept my eyes on him because I thought he was walking on the roadway. As I drove nearer, I noticed that he was walking in the ditch. About this time, my girlfriend asked me what that was walking on the roadway. I told her that it was not on the road, but in the ditch, which was about five feet below the road. I knew the depth because my brother and I went smelting there a few times. I explained to her that whatever was walking there had to be about eight or nine feet tall. She wanted to turn around and drive by it again to get a closer look. I told her no, that we would go around the back way, which would take another 30 minutes. I wanted it to be gone when we came back. I was driving home at about 1.30 in the morning. I think it was October and about 2004. I pulled up to a little winding road that I would head downhill and cross a creek by the canyon that leads up to the main road. But when I got to the one lane road, a huge pile of hay was on the road. I was so confused. I had an 86 Suburban and I pulled right up to this pile of hay that was in front of a large dumpster and pretty much occupying the whole lane. In my 86 Suburban, this pile of hay was taller than my hood. I pulled all the way up to it. It was straw-like and teepeed. Although very wide, it was like a pile of hay more narrow at the top and wide at the bottom. This pile of hay turned and made eye contact with me. It was so close, and yet I really can't remember any features of the face, except that all I could see was eyes. I froze. 
What I thought was a pile of hay is a grizzly bear. A grizzly bear that in that moment I thought he was going to make a fist and slam the hood of my truck. I guess I saw anger in its eyes, and that's what I imagined what would happen next. But instead, he looked away irritated, stood up, and walked into the forest. I can't remember the physique. I think I was so terrified I didn't watch him walk away. So this grizzly, in my mind at the time it was a grizzly, was kneeling, crouching, or sitting, and it was at eye level with me in my 86 Suburban. Then it stood up, and it doubled in size. Being so naive, I got home and was blown away by the huge bear I just saw that looked like hay and stood up and walked away. I retold my experience to my ex and some friends. I remember how they would just look at me so confused and just move on to something else in conversation. Or the only other response was, we don't have grizzly bear here in New Mexico. I never really brought it up again because I felt so ridiculous the first time I told anyone. If the opportunity arose, I might consider being hypnotized to recall his features. I just think I was so scared. I'm the type to pull the covers over my head and ignore whatever until the morning. I'm an engineer, and not some guy who goes looking for Sasquatch or anything of that nature. My encounter starts out by telling you why I was in that region to begin with. Every year, they put on a big bass tournament on Lake Thurman, South Carolina, or we like to call it Clark's Hill Lake. I started off like all others started off, by practicing on the lake the week before the tournament starts. I put my boat in miles from where my encounter happened that day. We rowed up the river for about an hour, just so you know my boat was running around 70 miles an hour most of the time, so we was way up the Savannah River before we came up to a cove on the right side of the lake. For miles and miles, there was no houses or roads up past the 378 bridge on the right side of the lake, which is the South Carolina side of the lake. We pulled in about 6.15 that morning. The sun was just coming up. I put down the trolling motor and began to start fishing. Bass fishing never stays in one place too long, so I trolled around about 30 yards from the bank, and we were there for about 10 minutes before I heard a loud scream. Not a human type of scream. It was deep and it had to be someone with a set of lungs on them, because it kept on for so long. Then it started hitting the trees. Then all of a sudden, a huge rock hit the water. I thought there was someone throwing rocks, so I hollered out, Hey, you about hit us down here. Then another one. This time, I could see where it was coming from, and this time it looked to be about 35 to 50 pounds coming over the trees, because when it hit, it caused a huge splash and wave. I crank up my boat and headed out of there as fast as I could. And no, I couldn't see the thing that was throwing the rocks. It was too thick to see that far in the tree line from the lake. Another note, I told only a few friends of what happened to me, and one of my friends said that happened to my uncle about three years ago. So I called his uncle, and he said, I haven't told anyone but family, and asked them not to say anything about what I saw that day. All he would tell me was, I will never fish that part of the Savannah River again. I ask, what part? You pass up 378 Bridge, about three miles on the South Carolina side of the river. I then told him about what happened to me, and he said one more thing. It chased my boat down, running beside the bank, and I was running as fast as the boat would go. He wouldn't tell me anything else. He just said he will never go back. Now for a speed of his boat, he had a 70 Johnson that should run his boat about 35 miles an hour. And for something to be running on two legs at that speed could not be a man. My name is James. I'm a program manager at a group home for at-risk teenage boys here in Utah. I know when someone is lying to me, and I'm very good at sifting through the bullshit and recognizing the truth, when or if it arrives. Teenagers are like wild animals. Just don't turn your back on them, because they will eat you. I was born and raised in Jackson, Wyoming, and spent my youth running around the woods and mountains from the southern end of Yellowstone through Grand Teton National Park and the surrounding mountains of Jackson itself. My ancestors settled Jackson and the surrounding areas, and they fought for every bit of what they had, and I was raised the same way. You take care of you and yours and help those in need, and if it's broken, then fix it. And when you give your word, then you honor it. Back home, we call that cowboy logic. It's the only way I know how to do things. 
So when I told this story to someone I thought I trusted and who I thought would help me out, instead, he said what I saw was impossible and would never happen. What the fuck? So I just kept my mouth shut about it for a long time and slowly started to trust my memories again. When I was around 10 years old, back in 1990, I had a friend who lived down the street from me who got a horse for his birthday. So I saddled up my horse and we hit the trail. Back then, kids like us could take off for a few days before anyone started worrying. I think I remember that we rode those poor horses all over that country for three days. The second and third day, we went up to this canyon called Cache Creek Canyon to see how far we could make it. We got to this place where they had put in a culvert in way back when they were still logging this area. The culvert was sticking out of the road and had holes in it, and it looked pretty gnarly. And we found that our horses would jump over it, so we must have ran them back and forth over that damn thing for an hour until the horses were all lathered up. We decided to unsaddle and let them cool off. I remember clearly that my horse had its ears pinned forward and would give a little snort now and again, concerned about something off in the timber, but I couldn't see anything. Then I smelled something awful, a rotting flesh mixed with a wet dog smell. The first thing that came to my mind was it must be a dead elk because that canyon is a migration route for elk in the fall and spring. I told my buddy that I was going to go check it out and see if I could acquire some ivory. I went up to the base of this cliff that was about 60 feet tall. The trees blocked the area between my friend and the horses and me. As I was scanning the area, I looked over to my right, and this giant black man was standing right there at the base of the cliff. The evening sun was behind me, and the way the shadow played off the base of the cliff, I could only see the top half of this man. Now, normally, that would be cause for concern, I suppose, but in my mind, it was another mountain man who decided to quit civilization and live off the land, like in the old days. I had been with my dad and grandpa when we met other men who would come down to stock up on supplies and then head right back up into the mountains, so I really just thought he was one of them. Yes, he was huge. But again, I was an ignorant little country boy who up to that point never met a black person before. The only thing I did know was what I saw on TV when we watched the Packers play, and all I knew is that those black folks were bigger than white folks, and usually better at sports than us. <laughs> so in my mind, that's what I was seeing. The man was enormous, with long dreaded black hair and a fairly long beard that was silver up the middle of it. This is where it gets weird. He was bald on the very top of his head, and I remember that it looked raw and possibly cut up or something, and I was thinking, man, that looks like it hurts. Another thing I noticed was his head was fairly pointed as well. He was wearing what I thought was a black bearskin coat because it was pitch black hair covering his upper body, but I could see his massive shoulder muscles and biceps moving under the hair. I'll never forget the look he gave me. It was a look of annoyance. I knew the look well because I was a really annoying kid back then, but he was more concerned about something else up the ridge because he would look up the ridge and study it for a bit than back at me, like I was in the way or something. I don't remember how long the encounter lasted, but it seemed to be a couple of minutes, maybe a little more. He then lifted his arm and grabbed a ledge on the cliff wall and kind of leaned against it. Then my buddy called out to me and he snapped his head over and so did I, and when I looked back at him, he just pulled himself up the cliff and grabbed onto another ledge with his hand and repeated it like two more times until he was at the top and disappeared from view. I yelled to my friend, did you see him? As he walked up to me, he asked, who was that? Several years later, I tried talking about it with him, and he claims he didn't see anything or anyone. I was sure he saw him, though. Anyway, a couple of years later, we were taking a pack trip to a place called Turquoise Lake. I remember I was 12 because that spring, my cousin and I were taught how to train our first colts and rode them on that pack trip. We got up to that same culvert, which was even gnarlier than before, and our colts wouldn't cross over it. As the rest of the group went on ahead, we stayed behind, trying everything to get them fillies to go over that culvert. After a while, we had to take a rest, so we just sat and talked for a bit. I was on my horse when I realized that I was standing right next to that cliff and was eye-level with the ledge where that man had put his hand on. Let me repeat that. I was on my horse and I was eye-level with where his hand was. 
that was about nine feet from the ground. I then proceeded to tell my cousin the story and what I saw, but he immediately blew me off, saying there was no way I saw a man that tall climb that cliff only using his arms. Even then, I hadn't thought much about it. It wasn't until 2007 that I started getting into Bigfoot, and I saw a drawing of one that some guy had drawn after he had an encounter. I thought my mind was going to quit me. I scrambled to find paper and pencil. I went to town, frantically drawing. My hands were shaking so bad. When I was done, I stepped back and just stared at it. There he was, the man I had seen so long ago. And all I did was make the creature the other guy drew bald and with a beard, and it was exactly what I remembered. Now say what you will, but I swear I believe I may have seen a Bigfoot that day. The only thing that doesn't make sense is the fear people have described. I didn't experience that. Maybe I was too dumb or innocent or both to have even thought to be scared. I don't know, but in my mind, these beings are a lot like us. They will get mean and aggressive if they feel like they or their family are being threatened. I could only imagine how scary that would be. In most cases, they just slip away further into the woods. I don't want to downplay what others have experienced, but I really believe they normally won't want to harm us as long as we're far enough away. But then, of course, there's probably some dickheads out there too, just like we have in our species, so caution must be taken at any rate. All the best, James. Thanks for listening. Be sure to watch the three-hour December prize giveaway video. Same as before, watch the video and comment the secret word and your favorite story. Happy holidays and good luck.